Welcome, welcome, my friends. Hello, here we are. It is the 30th of August here in New Zealand. It's 9am on a Wednesday morning. Believe it or not, I'm doing chat with Matt at the what used to be, quote unquote, the normal time. <laughs> After four months of disruption, as I gallivanted around the world, look, I've got hair going everywhere. I was going to have a shower this morning, and uh, I instead used that time that was allocated for a shower to um, try and get our uh Marie's computer to uh go through the HDMI cord to the uh television in the lounge room because she has friends coming over to do yoga together which they do on a Wednesday morning and uh we haven't done that for a while so we had to find the adapter and then trying to get the sound to work etc etc freaking technology uh <clears throat> it's both um an absolute miracle and an absolute curse <laughs> It seems it seems to be a good challenge every now and again to try and get technology to do what you think it should do easily. And of course, trying to remember what's changed from four months ago. And of course, the kids have their, you know, uh, what do you call those things, PlayStations hooked up to it and whatnot while we've been away. So who knows what changed. But anyway, we got there in the end um, after just scrolling through menus and clicking things. Um, but needless to say, I didn't get my shower, so my hair's all uh, out of place. Uh, such is life. This is Chat with Matt. <laughs> Here to talk rather than to look at my uh, beautiful features, including my hair. Choosing to talk about whatever might be going on for you, however we can serve you, uh, whatever questions, uh, comments, requests you may have of us, us being Matt and Mantara, uh, the beings or the energy with which I channel. Um, I know, I know, I don't make it look like I'm channeling most of the time. I just sit here and speak what comes out of my mouth without thinking about it. But believe it or not, that's what channeling is. And you don't have to put on a funny voice or change your facial features or anything like that to be in the process of channeling. Sister Susie. Hi, Matt. I feel like I've had a massive cleanse. Feel amazing sleeping through the night for four nights in a row for the first time in 19 years. Oh, that's pretty awesome, Susie. <laughs> I know you. Last time we spoke, you weren't feeling uh, particularly unwell. So um, this is this, right? A lot of these um, quote-unquote illnesses are actually purification events. And on the other side of those illnesses, purification events, is a breakthrough, right? Is a, a, a more freedom, more liberation uh, to be yourself. Um, yeah, COVID cleanse, exactly. Um, we can let go of all of the wrongnesses around most uh, situations if we choose um, and see that there's always an opportunity. <clears throat> and really, all that um, the most important thing, I don't like using that word important, but anyway, one of the most important things to do is when we are having a, you know, experience of discomfort slash illness slash injury slash um, bad luck um, is to remember that there's an opportunity in this and it is generally, you know, um, something that's clearing out of our field rather than just bad luck or something going wrong or, you know, I've made a mistake, et cetera, et cetera. And then feeling contracted around that, trying to fix it from an idea that it was wrong as opposed to supporting yourself through an uncomfortable experience choosing to maintain an intention that there's benefit in this. Because when you maintain that more expansive perspective, that there's benefit in going through whatever the situation is, then you tend to find what the benefit is, right? Because what we what we look for, we find, right? And so for pessimistic and looking for bad things, we tend to find bad things to back that up. When we're optimistic and looking for good things, we tend to find good things uh, to back that up. Um, and of course, you know, optimism and positivity can become toxic to the point where you sort of deny reality um, in a way that is mm, unkind. That's nice. The builders next door just started their jackhammer up. Um, but um, the the point is um, is you know it works. It works to stay fundamentally positive, expansive. Uh, opportunistic, in abundance consciousness rather than lack mentality is a very powerful thing to do in improving our lives and to improving our experience of whatever we're going through in the moment we're going through it. 
So, um, interesting that you're sleeping really well, Susie, in the run-up to what is quite a powerful uh, full moon happening um, in about 28 hours or so, I guess. It's at one, happening at 1.35 my time tomorrow, and it's 9 something oh five now. So, yeah, uh, 28 and a half hours time, the moon will be at its fullest. Um, it's a super moon, uh, so that means it's closer to Earth than it normally is and it's quite a big super moon so the moon has a slight elliptical orbit so sometime in the 28 days it's going around the earth it's closest right that happens every month right that it's closest it's only called a super moon when it's either full or new when it's at its closest point or within a few degrees of its closest point so um but this super full moon is happening very close to its closest point. In fact, it won't be closer to, for another couple of years um, at, at a full moon time. So anyway, so it's a super full moon. It will be larger and brighter than quote unquote normal. And I already saw that last night. It was looking beautiful out there as I uh, sat out in the spa, um, staring up at it. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't cursing, but I was... Uh, <laughs> And just marveling at how powerful that a celestial body that orbits our planet is, whatever it is. I know there's a lot of conjecture about what it is, but it certainly has influence, right? It pulls the tides and it influences human emotion, um, you know, our waters quite significantly. Uh, anywho, uh, and it's also a blue moon because it's the second full moon that's happening this month. So that's, you know, based on the Gregorian calendar, we can give it credence or not, but it's still people ascribe um, importance to it. And when people ascribe importance to something, then something has importance. <laughs> Believe it or not, right? It doesn't really matter whether it's a fictitious idea like, you know, Christmas or whatever happening on that particular date. The fact that millions of people are, are taking notice of an event or, or making a particular time auspicious makes that time powerful because it's collective consciousness, right? It's a morphogenetic field that's that's created through the expectations of, of many people, right? When many people hold an expectation around a particular moment, that particular moment now has some power because people's expectations are powerful. So the more people who buy into a particular idea, the stronger that idea becomes right this is just the power of each human as a generator of of destiny here on this planet <clears throat> we're all creating a collective destiny through our you know collective focus through our collective um, intent through our collective attention right attention is the real currency on this planet it's not money certainly not and a lot of people would say time is the most important thing but really it's attention because we all know that attention trumps time you know, you can spend um, five hours doing something and get nowhere, right? <clears throat> so you've invested five hours. But if you apply an hour of focused attention, you'll probably achieve much more than just five hours of time spent doing it, right? Attention is really what gets things done. Attention is how we experience the world. If we zone out, right, and just watch whatever, Netflix for, for one of something that's an easy target, um, then time can be, quote unquote, whittled away. You could say wasted, but it's still been experienced. But attention is how we experience life. So we all only have a certain amount of time and therefore time is precious to some degree. But what's more important is where do we put our attention during our time, right? Where is our attention at? Because we can live a, a very, very full life or a very, very empty life, depending on how we apply our attention, right? So attention is really the the prime commodity um, resource on this planet. And, you know, advertisers know this. Um, corporations know this. Getting people's attention is what's important. That's why they advertise in ways that grabs people's attention and draws them in. That's why television and screens in general work so well, because they flicker at a, at a frequency that pulls our attention into them, and then they can use that attention to their ends. Um, so, but at the end of the day, your attention is your responsibility, and it is under your control if you choose to um, um, 
take it, right? If you choose to take control of your attention, then you are going to be a much more powerful being on this planet, a much more empowered being when you are commanding where your attention is going, when you are aware of where your attention is going, and when you are making conscious, intentional choices about what you are putting your attention on, what you are focused on. I prefer the word attention to focus, because every time I say focus, people sort of zone out that they can't do it, right? Because they don't believe they have the capacity to focus. It's been sort of put on some sort of pedestal. It sounds hard, like hard work, but attention is somehow softer in many people's minds. Oh yeah, I can, I can um, maintain attention much easier than I can maintain focus. Right, because focus somehow implies that it's very narrow, whereas attention can be a little broader. Maybe I don't know, but I've just noticed uh, as talking to people that when you say focus, they they sort of automatically pull back, thinking they can't do it. But when you say just keep your attention on it, it seems more achievable. And it's the same thing ultimately. It's what I'm talking about. The same thing. It's like you know. We say where your focus goes, the energy flows. It's the same where your attention goes, the energy flows. Exactly the same, right? Um, I think the idea is focus is somehow unwavering and that if you look at something else and you've lost focus, right? Focus has to be pinpoint and directed and unwavering, whereas attention can be a little bit softer. Anyway, um, that's just an interesting thing that I've been inquiring about and dancing with and experimenting with different words and how they affect people and, and basically to meet the ends of helping people, um, live an empowered life and, and claim some freedom. So anyway, we've got this freaking full moon coming up. Um, <clears throat> it's in Pisces. Um, and of course the sun is in Virgo at the moment. We're in Virgo season as of you know, a w over a week now. Um, Susie said, mindset can really change. Can Mindset really can change. See, I always put things in the wrong order. Mindset really can change perspective. Exactly. And perspective changes or maintains your mindset. So, um, and, and both, uh, you know, it's interesting. Mindset and perspective could be uh, synonymous, right? They really are the same thing. It's our, our mindset is our perspective in many ways. But I get it. We think one is more malleable than the other. Um, but yes, basically our mindset and our perspective really change how we how we enjoy living on this planet, how how much um, we relax in the world and how much we find ourselves in purpose in the world and how much we enjoy living on this planet. Right, it all comes down to our the perspective and the mindset that we are maintaining. Um, as we as we move through the world, are we basically operating from love or fear? Are we basically operating from um, abundance consciousness or lack mentality? The, the, you know, are we are we at war with the world or are we expecting the world to give us opportunities to experience an expansive existence? You know, to 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 experience our existence in moments of now in expansive and creative ways. It all comes down to what you are choosing. And of course, that choice is not an easy choice to make when you have become habituated strongly in one direction. It's not easy to start going back in the other direction. And many, many, many of us, of course, have been programmed and habituated to seeing the world in a lack mentality, right? The whole world is telling us this is a competitive place of limited resource and you need to work really hard to not just survive, but to thrive, right? Or not just thrive, but to even to survive. Um, so we've been programmed into the idea that life is hard and then you die, right? This, these are common sayings that have been perpetuated throughout generations now of people <clears throat> having to struggle to survive and struggle to get ahead and to win their happiness through achievement, you know, through out competing other people to to get the better job, get the better car, get the better partner, get the better house, etc., etc., right? To do really well and to work really hard. And so all of that lack mentality and fear-based mentality that has us running on this treadmill um, is hard to pull out of. It's hard. There's a big, you know, I was talking before about morphogenetic fields. If enough people believe in something, then that thing has power. And this is the issue. And this is why, you know, certain powers are, are continually advertising to keep promoting certain ideas that keep the population in a fear-based, disempowered relationship with life itself. 
um, even the fear of death, right? How has that become so, so magnified on our planet, right? To the point where it, it you know, controls the bejesus out of out of people, right? That they, they, they can't relax and live life because they're too scared of dying. Um, <clears throat> and all of the rest and the way that that can then be, you know, turned around to keep people making choices about things. Uh, Any who's. Um, I'm just trying to think where I'm going here. Full moon coming up, right? Um, it's in... I'm going to, we're going to do a call tomorrow at, at the time of the full moon about this, but it's in Pisces and opposing the sun in Virgo, which is an interesting axis, right? Um, both, because it's interesting, because both Pisces and Virgo are very spiritual signs in many ways, um, but they're just at opposite ends of the spectrum in certain other ways, whereas Virgo is very sort of much more controlled and um, um, logical in how it does spirituality. Pisces is much more emotional and wishy-washy and etheric. Um, and so we've got this interesting op opportunity right now to really um, inquire into how we are seeing ourselves spiritually on the planet and potentially finding a balance between the sort of the rule-based expectations of Virgo and finding a, a more... Um, and, and, and but bringing some structure to Pisces, which can very easily sort of get lost in the woo-woo. That was uh, my doctor's office trying to phone me. I know they tried to phone me yesterday and I missed it. Um, and I have a feeling that every three years they basically phone to see if I'm still, um, if I'm still registered with their office because they haven't seen me for the last three years. And they're wondering if I'm registered somewhere else. Um, and every year, every three years, I have to tell them, no, I'm still registered with you. I just don't come to the doctors, <laughs> but I've got to be registered somewhere, I think, um, or I may as well be registered somewhere. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I get this call every couple of years. Um, <clears throat> so they phoned yesterday. So I, both, I suppose that's something to put on my list here. I've always got lists, right? We've all got these lists, things that need doing, um, Anywho, so yes, it's an interesting time to inquire a little bit more deeply into our own relationship with ourselves. This is what I'm dancing with this month in, in the Montara Transformation Empowerment Support Community is deepening our self-awareness, right? Which is what spirituality is, right? Uh, you know, I know, I know a lot of people, when you say spirituality, they think of religion, they think of organizations, they think of structures, they think of um, rituals, and stuff and and for me spirituality is all about your connection to spirit which is what you are right we're all spiritual beings having a human experience so spirituality for me is how connected are you to spirit how connected to you are you to the world beyond the physical manifestation of what we see feel and touch right taste here on the planet um and so i see this time is an awesome opportunity to deepen our spirituality, to deepen our self-awareness um, and, and to really inquire as to how we can better support ourselves even, how we can find more comfort in ourselves to move through what is a particularly chaotic time on this planet as a lot of things are changing um, very quickly and rather chaotically and in some way destructively. You know, there's a lot of destruction out there. There's a lot of these old structures that are destructuring, right? Um, they're coming apart, they're disintegrating out of our society, which is good, right? Because these structures have been used to control us for a long time and they haven't been particularly equitable or particularly fair or particularly um, useful in a lot of ways for us expressing ourselves in expansive ways and owning our individuality. You know, they've been very, very... Um, intent on sort of this reductionist mindset where everyone's treated the same. That's actually not very fair to treat everyone the same because we're all inherently different to start with. And so what's much more equitable is to treat everyone in a way that serves them as opposed to treat everyone the same, you know. Um, and so that's a fundamental change that society 
is in the process of, you know, the people, individuals are in the process of starting to understand more and society is in the process of starting to embody a little bit more um, so we can get rid of these, you know, global sort of structures, these centralised structures that out of this sort of born desire to be efficient, right, this desire for efficiency, um, we've, you know, reduced everything down to yes and no sort of questions and and treated everything similarly in a way um, that is is not particularly beneficial for humans expressing themselves on the planet. And that's what we've come here to do, right? So fundamentally, society is not working for us in a spiritual way because we don't get to express ourselves creatively, individually, um, expansively as the being that is inhabiting the body here on the planet, um, coming for experiences that furthers our soul wisdom. So big changes happening, which are exciting and painful, both um, concerning, of course, for our little ego that wants to survive, because it looks like a lot of the structures that we've relied on for survival are being eroded or flat out destroyed, um, destroyed, right, destroyed. Um, so this is all uh, happening. And to help us through that, in my opinion, what is sort of most beneficial is to get in touch with your deeper, deeper self, right? Your your more inherent divine self, so that you have a stronger foundation of faith, not faith in some external power is going to look after you, but a faith in who you be inherently as a spiritual being having a human experience, so that you don't feel so threatened by these support networks, these old support networks falling apart so that much more inclusive and um, empowered support networks can, can emerge and develop and, and you know, evolve. So um, <clears throat> am I tying any of this together or have I just sort of thrown a whole heap of stuff on the table? So anyway, this full moon is really working in to give us that opportunity and I'll talk more about that tomorrow. I feel uh, as an opportunity to get a little bit deeper into self-inquiry and to really uh, find some self-awareness through that inquiry and some self-acceptance through that um, so that we can find more peace within ourselves and we can find, feel more empowered in ourselves and less, um, less reliant on the external world giving us sort of this environment that is um, easy to relax in and feel safe in because I don't think we're going to get an environment that is easy to relax in and feel safe in. I think we have to up level so that we can feel relaxed and safe in an environment that is in um, this change process <clears throat> for at least the next few decades. So, um, yeah, so that's our pathway forward. That's what we're holding space around and that's what we're choosing to help anyone who wishes that help. Uh, to do, right? Get in touch with yourself, find a deeper connection to who you be, and then to allow that um, awareness and that knowledge of self, self-knowledge to then flow out into how you are doing the world, right? In a more, um, what's the right word? Empowered way and relaxed way. The poster that I put up was an interesting one that I found last night as I was sort of scrolling through. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm tethered to multiple chords. Um, there we go, get the flare of it. it oh, it's probably backwards anyway. <laughs> but anyway, it says Atma Bhakti. And this is a term that is not found in a lot of the yogic scriptures, Atma Bhakti. It's, it's, in, uh, it's mentioned a few times in Vedanta, but it's not mentioned a hell of a lot. And certainly most of the teachers slash gurus don't talk a lot about Atma Bhakti. They talk a lot about Guru Bhakti, um, they talk a lot about bhakti in general. Bhakti is devotion, right? And guru bhakti is devotion to the guru. Atma bhakti is devotion to your own higher self. Uh, the atma is the soul or the higher self. Um, there's some debate about the exact definition of atma in terms of soul, higher self, division. But anyway, atma bhakti is mentioned in these scriptures, but not very much. And it's basically devotion to your own higher self, your own spirit. Um, and from what I've read and, and my own inquiries around this idea is that all bhakti, whether it be guru bhakti or bhakti to um, a deity like Krishna or Shiva or 
anything else for that matter, right? Um, bhakti to your parents, which is is highly promoted in many cultures, right? Where they, where you know, we were just in Vietnam three months ago now, but on the altars, and every house has an altar, right? As you walk down the streets of Hoi An anyway, and you look in, they have a big altar there, Buddhist and everything else, but they always have pictures of their grandparents there and even their parents, depending on how old they are, right? So, hey, Brother Rich. So, um, devotion to your lineage, devotion to your teachers, devotion to your parents is very, very strong in many, many cultures and, and absolutely uh, nothing wrong with that to, to help you open your heart to something um, that, that you place some faith in and, and some some hope in and, and trust in, you know. But ultimately, you know, reading the scriptures and inquiring myself around this idea, no matter what you are devoted to, the idea of being devoted to something is to basically slowly but surely find that you are behind, your higher self is behind whatever the object of your devotion is. And so slowly all devotional practices lead to Atma Bhakti, where you recognize that you are basically devoted to your self, which is God as well, right? You are God. Um, I know that's a, a contentious statement and a lot of people think it's almost blasphemy or they think it's absolutely blasphemy to, to proclaim yourself as God. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, that is the truth as we know it. So um, hang me up again. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even believe I can laugh at that. But anyway, um, uh, so yeah, uh, and, uh, and this self-inquiry process and this opportunity with the full moon and, and getting a little bit more deeply in touch with your spirituality and having some deeper self-awareness around who you be beyond this little complex of, of mentality and emotionality and, and physical desires that's running around here on the world, on the planet, right? When we peel away some of those layers and see what's more deep within us, what are some more intrinsic desires, what really motivates us on a deeper level, we start to recognize this Atma within us and we can be more, become more and more quite unquote, devoted to it, more and more appreciative of it, more and more um, aligned with it. And, and that's powerful, right? When we all start doing that, we become much more powerful beings um, because we can, we can influence a lot more energy. We can direct a lot more energy in powerful ways when we start to recognize the power of who we be. You know, as you believe it, so it will be. When you believe yourself to be God and capable of manifesting great things, not in a sort of a wishy-washy abracadabra, look there, I've just created a Lamborghini type of way, um, then, then the world will change in positive directions. Mary said, I so needed to hear this as I am... As I am treading, I am that. Reading, sorry. As I am reading, I am that. And Sri, in this, yeah, I'm not even going to try and say that name, talks about this. Moving away from ego is not easy, as I find it can be quite a slippery slope. Yeah. And <clears throat> in my experience, the quote unquote process of moving away from ego is a process of sliding through ego or expanding out of is probably a better way of describing it. You can't really just step away from your ego. You basically expand out of your ego. So the ego is still there. You don't step away from it. You don't you don't disown it. You don't vilify it. You basically just start to recognize that you are more than your ego. Not that your ego is bad or wrong. It's just a small aspect of you. It's an important aspect of you. It's a very important aspect of every person here. Every individuation of God's source universe has an ego for a reason. It maintains this concept of separation. And that's important for us to have the experiences that we're here to have. But the point is there's more of us than just our ego. The problem with most humans on the planet is they are completely identified with their ego and even completely identified with just a small subsection of their ego, right? They don't even know the full extent of their egoic desires. They're just railroaded into a particular program that they are running, uh, a very egoic program, of course. So as we sort of expand, expand, expand through these various layers, this aspect of ego self 
that keeps us separated becomes less influential and we start to have the opportunity to see more connection and more capacity for ourselves, right? We start to, as we start to recognize that this small separate part of self is just a program and that we are very much connected through a very intricate web of energy to every other single thing in this sort of collective we call God Source Universe, then we understand that we have much more influence than we would have if we were just the little ego self, which is completely separate and fighting for survival, right? Which doesn't have much influence over nothing, right? And it doesn't really want to influence anything other than just getting enough food and, and pleasurable activities for itself, right? So... Um, this is the point. Yeah, it's not to try and fight the ego. It's not to try and push the ego down or, or make the ego wrong because that doesn't work, right? If you pick a fight with the ego, I can guarantee you the ego will win. So don't pick a fight with your ego. Um, love your ego uh, and nourish and care for your ego and at the same time gently expand out of conceiving yourself as only the egoic being. Mary said, just... Paying attention to awareness itself takes effort, of course. So used to being identified with body mind. Yeah, of course it takes effort. It takes it takes um, it takes devotion. That's why we talk about Atma Bhakti. That's why we talk about devotion to yourself, because it takes a devoted effort, right? A dedicated effort to start to expand, right? Because everything around you is trying to pull you back into that small identification. Everything around you is trying to pull you back into fear-based living, right? This egoic fear-based living, this lack mentality is promoted all around you. So it takes effort to stay aware of that and to make conscious choice to not get drawn in so much. Of course, we all get drawn in to some degree. We're all influenced by these programs. None of us are immune, but we can make conscious effort. We can we can direct our attention and our energy in ways that is more expansive. And that's our job. That's our responsibility. That's really what our responsibility is. How do you expand? Asks Michelle. That's a great question. Basically, the, the easiest way to expand is to relax, right? <sighs> when you relax and choose to stop identifying with fear-based um thinking or um, potentials, then naturally your energy field expands. As your energy field starts to expand because you have relaxed, you can start to think about more expansive things. You can start to uh, inquire about more... Um, what's the... More universal concepts as opposed to narrow, self-absorbed um, concepts. So relaxation is really important. Maintaining an awareness on more than your little self, right? Start to notice things, like you start to notice um, how birds are interacting, right? That's an expansive thing to do. You're taking your attention out of a narrowness of self-absorption and into a more curious relationship with the world around you. That is inherently expansive. Um, breathing and noticing the breath coming in and out, right? And, and noticing the fact that you actually expand very physically and energetically with each inspiration helps you to expand, right? So you notice that inhalation, it just feels expansion. And then you allow the exhalation to be relaxing. You're relaxing into that more expanded state, right? That helps you to expand. Um, so <clears throat> it's not, quote unquote, good to expand in terms of virtuous and that God is going to reward you because you're being expansive, but it feels good to be in a more expansive field, right? Things hurt less when you're expansive. When you are contracted, which is the opposite of expansive, when you're contracted in stress, then all of the fibers in your being, not just your physical body, but also in your energetic body are tight and inter intertangled and Anything that's trying to move through there, which things are trying to move through every energetic field because change is the nature of the universe, right? Things are trying to change always in your energetic field. This is, this is evolution taking place. But when things are tight because you are stressed and contracted, then it hurts. There's friction. Things don't move easily. 
there's a struggle for energies to shift. When you're more expansive, things can move through you more easily with less friction. That means less pain, less, you know, uncomfortable sensation. So, you know, we choose to be expansive because it feels good to be expansive, because it's conducive to living a more happy, joyful life to be expansive. We can see things from other points of view when we're expansive. We're more flexible when we're expansive. We're more tolerant when we're expansive. We're more open to change when we're expansive. And so anything that's helping you become more tolerant, more flexible, more open to change is a process of expansion by default, right? They go both ways. So don't worry too much about, oh, I've got to expand, I've got to expand. How do I expand, right? Fundamentally, that means just relax and get out of your narrow thinking and out of your stress and, and take some deep breaths, right? But fundamentally, anything that you are choosing to do that helps you become more tolerant and more relaxed and more easygoing and more flexible, flexible in your physical body, right? Doing yoga and tai chi and all of the, that sort of qigong or um, more flexible mentally, right? Which can be doing all sorts of... Um, mind games, puzzles, um, and conscious intent to interact with people in more flexible ways, right? And not just interact with people, but interact with situations that are being presented to you, interacting with the news that you are consuming, right? How do you choose to let go of your first fund or your first uh, reactionary judgment of what you hear being presented to you uh, from the news, right? And you go, oh, that's an old program, right? How do I relax out of that? How do I see this on first principles? How do I maintain a more open attitude to what might have happened rather than thinking I know what caused that? Oh, like well, this fires in Maui. Oh, that was this. That was this. This was, you know, we already have these prejudgments in our head that we've been programmed with. How do we let go of being that reactionary being and become more responsive? How do we go, what does Maui really need now? Right? How do I hold space for what's going on there without jumping into what's right or wrong about what's happened? It's hard. It's hard, right? And I'm not saying that uh, various awarenesses about what could have happened are wrong and it's wrong to have those awareness. Not at all. I think we should all have as, as wide a spectrum of awareness around potentials of what could have happened. But the point is, none of us are really going to know what happened because we weren't there witnessing it. Um, and at least we didn't have that expansive overview of it. And at the end of the day, we don't need to know. That's the point. We don't need to really know because how does knowing change anything? How does knowing fix anything? Right. So the the point is, is how do we how do we intrinsically hold space for the best outcomes without getting locked into this mentality of needing to know facts and needing to know the truth, right? This thing called the truth brings many, many spiritual seekers unstuck because they go down rabbit holes looking for truth. And really, ultimately, truth is very subjective. Truth is very individual. And... <clears throat> It doesn't actually help a lot of us to get too entangled in this thing called the truth. So uh, what's more important is, is what's beneficial. What can we do in this circumstance right now? How can we respond to what is being presented to us in a way that feels in integrity to who we be? Right. As opposed to getting all our nose all out of joint with the injustice of what we think happened. Anyhow. I've gone well over time just for a change, my friends. Thank you very much for stimulating uh, an interesting conversation. Hopefully, it has supported some of you uh, to um, think about some stuff, inquire, and to change how you interact with the world to some degree. I know this is a slow, slow process. I'm not uh, holding. I'm not holding uh, expectations that you hear me talk about something once, or hear anyone talk about something once, and then change your life. Um, much love. Anyway, I'll be back tomorrow um, in, as I said, whatever it is, 28 hours or something. A little less now. 10 o'clock. Yeah, 27 hours. Um, we'll be back in about 27 hours. Uh, so that's three hours later than now, plus 10 minutes. <laughs> tomorrow for the full moon call. So I look forward to serving you then. And of course, there's a replay available. You can always listen to that at any time. Much, much love, my friends. I will speak to you then. Bye for now.